there's not going to be a Cornell and a uh, Columbia technical processing group, there's going to be a system distributed across the two universities that do cataloging and all of that for the two together. So, and then they're moving towards shared infrastructure as well. We're going to have one system to support these two competitive institutions. So when you compete, when you cooperate, it looks like you can do both. And then, some of the got. <laughs> Uh, so, what I want to take you to, going back to the second, well, Alex mentioned these when I go by. I'm already out of time. Uh, so, it's important at this day and time not to look at technology from the eyes of the 1980s and 90s. That the technology, we can expect far more from it than we ever have in the past. You know, you don't need to think about, well, how many records can my server hold? You can think ambitiously about what you want to do and find the right technology that will help you do it. So how much do you want to cooperate? How big can our system be? Uh, how much, how many, do you want to have a bunch of little systems or one big system? Now, those are choices that are on the table today that weren't on the table when a lot of organizations automated years ago. So, but it's hard to kind of break from the history. I've always had an automation system. I wouldn't be very comfortable with shutting somebody else's. Uh, but, Options are, are feasible, I would say. I'm not saying that anybody has to do anything, but, there, but there's a level of feasibility that's in place today that hasn't been there in the past. You have to be willing to rethink <coughs> what your people do. Do you want to follow the same copy and original cataloging models that have been just fine for 30 years, or do you need to kind of face ways of managing metadata and collections in ways that scale to the shape of collections today that are increasingly digital electronic and a shrinking amount in print. So there comes a point where you've got to reevaluate what your folks do every day, uh, and it's not just to kind of you know, operate the ILS every day. And that's kind of what's defined a lot of technical services departments. We have our cataloging department, our acquisitions department, uh, verification, and all these kinds of things that are built around kind of the hunger of the ILS for those kinds of tasks, not necessarily in the priorities and business needs of the organization. So there's that right. Where are we in discovery today? You know, we're nowhere near there. You know, I think they're getting better. You know, the, the action that I'm seeing in recent months and years is this ebook integration. There's been amazing progress that wasn't there before to allow libraries to get beyond the overdrive eject button to truly integrate a discovery and loaning of ebooks within their native environment. I would say that's probably the biggest driver that I, that I see in public libraries today. What would you say drove that? So, a variety of things. I mean, the ebook thing? Um, the overdrive basically opened up and started using the APIs to allow it. I mean, they're, they're, they want to preserve their customer base. They, they, have, they have to be in tune with their customers. So they knew that they could demand it be done in a certain way, their way, or they're, they're going to mask it, but there wasn't competition before. 3M went out of the gate saying, our system is built out of APIs, you know, have at it. So the world kind of changed from being a monopoly to be a competitive environment. So it was the competition and then that, the, that was a piece the, of the, it. The and just the demand, readers the demand first. The community. Yeah, readers first is probably one of the most important initiatives and really kind of fun to watch something that grew out of libraries be, you know, take legs in the commercial organizations that support libraries. Also in the case of Overdrive, when they found out Biblio Commons was trying to do it with screen scraping. Yeah, they had was thrashing their system. Demanding, they wanted to give them a plan B. Yeah. They like At that. first they turned it off, yes. and then they said, okay, you know, we can give you this one API that will at least let you do most of what you want to do without thrashing our systems. Right. So, overdrive is the most inefficient when it comes to interoperability. It just scrapes screens. But, but, but even that initiative was customer driven yeah. was because two or three big metropolitan libraries put up yeah. the money it was New York for public, New York public Boston, and Boston and Seattle. Public. Yeah. I see how it was in part of the deal. Like, I'm not aware of it right now. So, you know, we've got to kind of raise our voices together sometimes to affect change. Um, so, one thing I wanted to go to. 
incredibly valid. I wanted to show you this. So when you think about who is out there building technology on behalf of libraries, who wins? Open source, the commercial in general. How many folks are working on Evergreen? No. Six for Equinox, add another FTE or two from the community. You know, you're, you know, it's less than 10. Versus 170 developers writing software for a commercial company. Uh, you can see that Wallet has a pretty good number. And if I do think they're up to 89 now. No reason to lose that scene. So, you know, who is making the investment to deliver software to libraries? How many, how many hands are on the problem? So, even though I like open source, there just aren't enough people involved writing code for it to ever scale. Yeah. And these are folks that mostly that are just trying to bring ILS systems up to a certain subset of functionality that have been in proprietary and gray library systems for decades. You're reflecting, though, the, 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 the staffing from the support companies, though, that are doing this. In, so I talked to, to Chris uh, Horman from Cole. You know, he's, he's the, he works for Catalyst IT in Australia. He's the one who wrote the original COA code. And together, we came up with 15, counting folks in the community writing code. Because there's a lot of folks who do it part time. You know, they do a commit right. every once in a while. How many folks are really <coughs> doing software engineering on using open source systems full time? What are, you know, and do they have kind of the full staffing that a commercial software company would have as far as product development and management, software development, quality control, you know, customer testing, all these kind of things. It's all done kind of informal. A lot of that gets done, but not at scale. So, even though philosophically I appreciate open source, when I take a look back at the numbers, it worries me a bit. And you can look at things like the fulfillment project, where a company was contracted to write some code. It's out in the open, but you know, did it have enough resources to displace any kind of commercial system? You know, how, how, what's the growth curve of COA and uh, Evergreen and COA compared to what we're seeing in the commercial systems? How much do you see ebook integration as kind of the current development initiative where you see that? It's up here, not down here. Do they have the infrastructure behind the scenes to do that? And we have you know, Java based systems here. You know, a Perl based system and then a mixed system of CD and Perl and everything. So, you know, what are you going to bet on? You have to bet on philosophy, sure. Open source is good, it's a good selling point. You have to base on the infrastructure that's built out of and the resources that are, you know, behind building it. But most of all, what it's capable of doing and solving the business problems that you face. If your main problem is how do I check out my books at the circulation desk? You know, that's one thing. But if you're worried about patron engagement, ebook lending, social features, all of those, you know, I, I don't see that being delivered on the open source community so much yet. So I kind of ch constantly challenge them to kind of work on those issues. But, you know, it's, it's a different ecology, ecosystem. We're a bit behind on our schedule. Yeah, lunch anyway, right? <laughs> what we could do is go ahead and have people get lunch and come yeah. back in and then uh, sure. if you're willing and able to answer any more questions, we could do that as an open Q&A. Yeah, it's all good for me. Jill, do you want to announce about the